Um, so today, our kind of our last day before break, um, we're finishing up with the last part of the ionic compounds. So I kind of told you guys we'd be spending this whole week on it. And so we worked on doing the ionic compound names on Monday, and we did the formulas on Wednesday. Okay, but all of those, um, the ones that we did on Monday and Wednesday, those were called binary ionic compounds. And they are binary because they only contain two different elements. So they have like a metal and a non-metal. Okay. Some of the metals might have been those transition metals that need the Roman numerals in the name. Some of them were the regular metals, but they still only had like one metal and one non-metal. Um, what we're going to see today is there's kind of a, another subtype of ionic compounds and they have, um, they're called ternary because they have more than two. So they're not binary, they don't have two. They have more than two elements in them. And so what we're gonna see today is that sometimes it will be a metal and one of these uh, ions, it's called a polyatomic ion, that's the negative one. Um, sometimes there might not be a metal because there is one of these polyatomic ions that's positively charged. So from now, kind of our thinking is gonna shift, not so much metal and non-metal, for an ionic compound, but we have to think in terms of cation, meaning a positive charge, and anion, meaning a negative charge. And so that's why it's so important that we're able to associate, you know, metals are cations, non-metals are anions, but then we also have these polyatomic ions um, that can be a cation or an anion for our ionic, ionic compounds. Um, so I'm going to switch over to our lesson. We're going to kind of look through it look at some of the examples because we're doing the names and formulas for these types today that include these things called polyatomic ions. And um, then I'm gonna switch over to the iPad and we're gonna try to do some practice because at the end today, your assignment is mixed practice. So your assignment after you go through today's lesson and you check and do all your practice within the lesson, um, your assignment, it says it's just names and formulas and in parentheses, it lists a bunch of stuff. That's all the stuff we've covered. So we've done covalent compounds and name or formulas and names. And then main group, that means the metals that have one charge because they're called main group metals. Um, the variable, that is the transition metals that have the multiple charges. And then the last thing that's listed is polyatomics, which is what we're adding in today. So when you do your practice quiz, your assignment after the lesson, it's gonna have some of everything. So what it's checking, it's checking not only can you do the name or the formula, but do you know how to use the different rules, okay? Because like for covalent, we need prefixes. For ionic, we don't need prefixes. And then if it's a transition metal, then we need a Roman numeral in the name for it. If it's not a, metal, a transition metal, if it's a regular metal, we don't need a Roman numeral. And then what we're gonna see today is with these ones that have polyatomic ions, sometimes the formulas are going, it's going to need parentheses, not all the time. So we're gonna take a look at the different situations uh, for that. And so this, what it's testing is it's testing of all the stuff we've covered so far, um, can you do their names and formulas? And also, can you tell them apart so that you know which rules to use? So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can. <clears throat> All Okay, so um, on our agenda for today, okay, um, we're talking about writing names and formulas of ionic compounds with polyatomic ions, and we're going to talk about what they are and how to do that. And then for what you guys need to do, you need to make sure there's a Google form that's a check-in before we go to break. So please make sure you fill that out if you didn't already. And then we're going to kind of look at the lesson, the notes together a little bit. And then the last three things, these are kind of the assignments. So everybody has to do number three, okay? Because that's the one that's checking, like I just mentioned, you know, do you know how to do the names and formulas for all these different types based on their rules or what elements are in it and that kind of thing. Um, and then the four and five, that depends on how you do on number three, okay? If you don't score a certain a high enough grade on number three, it's automatically gonna open up number four. So that's why it says here, you will only be assigned this if you don't score well on the previous assignment. So number four is like, you know, if you don't score well on number three, it's going to automatically tell you to do this next thing. It'll open up in the module and you'll do that in order to help replace the grade from number three to help your, to you know, bring it up. And it also help review the different types. So if you need to make sure you like write down more examples and work through how to do them. 
And then um, if you do well on number three, you'll skip and you'll go straight to number five. And then those of you that have to do number four, after number four, you'll go to number five. And this one's optional, okay? So there's a page that has a couple of links. One of the links is for covalent uh, names and formulas. The other link is for all of the ionic. And so it includes the transition metals and the regular metals, and it includes the polyatomics in the option for the ionic. And so it has links to a couple of websites where you can practice um, doing names and formulas. So if you feel like you still need to do some more practice um, to kind of understand, then that's on there. So again, number five is optional. Everybody does three. <clears throat> Some people will have to do number four, depending on how you do on number three. And then uh, after that, number five is optional um, for you if you feel like you still need to practice a little bit more. Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead here. So then you have your, your check in form, and it's a Google form on there. It'll pop up after a few seconds. And then you'll fill that out and submit it for me. And then here is our lesson. So we're going to kind of go through this and look at what these polyatomics ions are before we um, start practicing them. Okay. Um, so ionic compounds, polyatomic ions. Okay. Polyatomic ions are ions that have more than one atom. And so up until now, like I said, um, we've been calling, you know, the positively charged ion is the cation. The negatively charged ion is the anion. And so we're gonna shift our thinking. So we're gonna, instead of thinking metal and non-metal, we're gonna use the terms cation and anion because up until now, cation has always been a metal element, anion has always been a non-metal, okay? But what's gonna happen is there are some ionic compounds who they still have a cation and an anion, but it might not necessarily be a single metal element or a single non-metal element. It might be one of these polyatomic ions. And so that's kind of what we've been thinking, you know, and we don't use prefixes. So, you know, if this is my cation, if this is my anion, I check their charges. These are each one. So that balances. So the formula would just be NaCl with no subscripts. And then the name for that would be sodium chloride because I don't use prefixes in the name. I just change the nonmetal to IDE. Okay, that second element. Um, what's going to happen is that we have uh, our ions, okay, metals form the cations, non-metals, those are over here, the anions. So all the negatively charged ones over here, those are all of our anions and they just happen to be, they're all non-metals. And then all of the cations over here on this left side, these are all metals, okay? Um, what's gonna happen is that we have these polyatomic ions. And as I said, if you kind of break down the, the word, poly means many or more than one. And then atomic or atom, that means atoms. So polyatomic ions are ions. So they're something that has a charge, that's what an ion is, um, that contain more than one atom. And so the atoms, they function like a group, okay? So they're, they work together. And so we treat it as one, uh, one thing, okay? So that's why we call it an ion. So these are a couple of examples, okay? Um, this one is the bicarbonate ion, and sometimes it's also called the hydrogen carbonate. So there are a couple of them that have two different ways you can name them, okay? Um, but this one is bicarbonate, or sometimes it's called hydrogen carbonate, and it has hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen in its formula. And so if you look at the formula, it has one hydrogen, H, it has one carbon, and it has three oxygens, okay? It's this HCO3. So that's what the formula of it tells me. It tells me that the bicarbonate ion is made up of one hydrogen atom, one carbon atom, and three oxygen atoms. And I can see here, here's the little picture if we build the model of it. Um, the black one is my carbon, uh, the reds are my oxygen, and the blue is the nitrogen, I'm sorry, the hydrogen. Um, so that's tell it, showing me that. Here's what its Lewis structure would look like if we drew it out, okay? Um, but notice it has this negative charge, okay? So that this group of atoms, when they're bonded together like this, they function as one group, and they have a negative one charge. So down here, the subscripts tell me the number of atoms in it, and then up in the top right, there'll still be a charge, a one or minus one, a minus two, minus three, you know, or a plus one. Here's another example. This one is called cyanide. Cyanide is just one carbon atom and one nitrogen atom, okay? So it doesn't have any subscripts, but it still, it does have a charge. It's got a negative one charge as well, okay? So these are a couple examples. There are a lot more of them, and so you're, we're gonna see a list here um, that we need to refer to. So here, this is a table and you can Google polyatomic ion list or chart and there's tons of different charts. This chart doesn't even list all of them. Okay. There are more than this, but these are just common ones. And, um, it just says these are the, some of the most common in their charges. Um, if the charge has no number, it implies it's one. So these ones that just have a plus or a minus 
and there's not a number, that's going to be a plus or minus one. If it has a charge uh, that's not one, it'll look like this. So like this one has a two, uh, or if I come down here, there are some that have three, negative three, okay? Um, and so it says, what's the only polyatomic cation on the list? So looking at this list, we have to know first off, what is a cation? And then which, what's the only thing on this list that would fit into that category? So first off, can somebody tell me what a cation is? It has a positive charge. No. Modi, were you talking? I think I had my computer on mute. Nobody knows what a cation is? Let me see. Did somebody say something in the chat? Let me check the chat. Metal with the positive charge. Uh, yeah, so, so cation is positive charge. Yeah, I just saw you said in the chat. Thank you. Um, so yes, a cation is the ion that has a positive charge. Um, if it's an element, then yes, it will be a metal. Okay, but in general, cation is just something that's got a positive charge. Um, so now knowing that, what's the only thing on this list that would fit that definition? What's the only thing on here that has a positive charge? Ammonium. Yep, ammonium, right? So ammonium, and then the formula is, it's one nitrogen, so it's N, and it's four hydrogen, so it's NH4, and then it has a positive one charge, okay? So I can kind of check myself here, and yes, it's ammonium, okay? Uh, what are the two polyatomic ions that have a charge of minus three? So if we come back up here to our list. So which ones are minus three on this list? Plus three? Minus three. So there's only two. Uh, Brian said it here. He said it's these last two. So if you notice they're in order, like this is positive one, and then all these that are after it are negative one. And then here with carbonate, we start with negative two. These are all negative two until the very last two. So phosphate and arsenate are the only ones on this list that are negative three. Um, there are more. There's another one that's called phosphite. So it's got an I-T-E instead of an A-T-E. Um, and it only has three oxygens instead of four. But on this list, the only two that have negative three are phosphate and arsenate. All right, what is the polyatomic ion that contains only one type of atom? So on which one only has one type of atom? So that means it's only gonna have one element symbol. It's not gonna have two different elements in it. Let's see if you guys can find it. All right, we got an answer here in class. Anybody online got an answer? Peroxide? Yes. They, peroxide. Yep, peroxide. So peroxide is two oxygen atoms um, that are bonded together and they have a negative two charge, okay? They have some extra electrons. And so like this peroxide is what's in hydrogen peroxide. So like when you, um, the stuff in the brown bottle from like the pharmacy that you uh, put on like wounds and it bubbles up because it's, it's disinfecting it, okay? Um, peroxide is this oxygen ion or this oxide peroxide ion that's in there with hydrogen and then it bubbles and it gives off um, the gas because it's reacting with uh, the bacteria and the things that are in the wound. It's cleaning them. Okay. Um, and so it is still a polyatomic ion. Even though it only has one element, it's got two, it's still got more than one atom. So that's kind of why that question's in here about this one is just to show you that even though it's one, one type of atom, it's just oxygen, because there are more than one of them bonded and it has a charge, that still makes it a polyatomic ion, okay? All right, so naming ionic compounds, it's basically, we're still following the same process. Our positive cation always goes first in the naming formula. The negative anion always goes second. We still do not use prefixes. Those are only for covalent. The only difference for writing the formula is that sometimes you might have to use parentheses around the polyatomic ion. And we're gonna look at a couple examples for why, okay? What I don't want you to do, I don't want you to do uh, go parentheses crazy because this is, what well, once we introduce this almost every year, there's people that they just start putting parentheses on like every chemical formula. 
Um, and you don't need them on everyone. You only need them in certain situations with these polyatomic ions. So as we go through the examples, just make sure you're kind of paying attention to when to use them. Um, the names are all not, uh, the not changed. You do the names the same way. Um, the only thing that's gonna be slightly different is you don't have to, the second atom or the second L ion, the anion, you don't have to change the ending to IDE like we did the nonmetals. You're just gonna use the name from the table that you have to refer to. So for example, if I had um, this formula, MgNO32, see again, see how the NO3 is in parentheses? That's because I had to add a two outside to have the charges be balanced. So you only use parentheses if you need more than one of your polyatomic ions to balance the charges. So on this one, if we have our little table to refer to, um, and you still will also need a periodic table because you may have to name, you know, the metal, if there's a metal element, okay, like you'll still need to look up the name for that if you don't know the name of that element. So Mg, that's our cation, and that's magnesium, that's a regular metal from the periodic table. The anion, though, this is a polyatomic ion, and I can tell because it's one of these ones that's got more than one um, atom, okay, grouped together. And so NO3 is the formula for it. And so I need to come over here and find NO3. And if I look right here, here is NO3. It's got a negative one charge. Don't confuse it because some of them are really close. Like right up here is NO2. And their names are only different by one letter. Okay, there's a lot of them like that where there's like two or three versions and they're only slightly different. So be careful when you're looking at this list. Okay, um, but NO3 is nitrate. And so that's the anion. And so the name's just magnesium nitrate. That's it. Okay, I don't change the ending to IDE. Okay, if I have a polyatomic ion, I just copy it from this table. That's it. Um, for doing the um, formula, it's gonna be a little different. So that's in our next section. But this last part, this is pretty important. You might want to add this into your notes because this is kind of showing you all the possible combinations for an ionic compound. So we might have a polyatomic cation, which the only one that that fits is ammonium. That's the one we looked at. And then the anion would be, could be a nonmetal, like chlorine or um, oxygen, something from the periodic table that's a nonmetal. Um, I could have a metal as my cation, and I could have one of my polyatomic ions as an anion. So these are three different examples. So this one's calcium nitrate, magnesium hydroxide, and iron two um, sulfite, okay? Um, so it, this doesn't, it could include the ones with Roman numerals or regular metals, but any kind of metal with one of the polyatomic ions that has a negative charge, the anions. And then I also could have one where I have ammonium as the polyatomic cation and it's paired up with one of the polyatomic anions. So these are the ones that always trip people up because people get so locked into thinking that you have to have a metal and a nonmetal in your um, ionic compound that the ones that have ammonium, um, like these bottom two and the top one, they confuse people because they think, oh, well, those are all nonmetals, so that must be covalent. Okay, but the thing here is there's more than two nonmetals. Remember covalent? They were all just two nonmetals bonded together. So these have more than two because the ammonium is a polyatomic ion. Okay, so these are just different examples for the possible combinations that you could have. The cations are all highlighted in red, the anions are all highlighted in blue. All right, so the, you have some practice with doing, doing names of the polyatomics. I'm gonna let y'all can do that on your own. I'm not gonna skip, do that with you right now because uh, I wanna go over writing the formulas, okay? So again, the basic process is the same as when we did the binary ones. You identify the cation and you identify the anion, you identify their symbols. Then you uh, write them with the charges and then you can do the crisscross method to balance the charges or you can do like we did last time where uh, in the video where he kind of wrote out until the charge is balanced and then he counted how many of them for the subscripts. Um, but remember, if you do the crisscross method, remember that you do need to do this extra step of checking the subscripts to see if they need to be simplified uh, or if you need to remove a one, okay? The new thing, okay, here's what's different. If you have a polyatomic ion and you need to add a subscript because you need more than one of it, you have to put the polyatomic ions formula in parentheses and that subscript outside. But you don't use them all the time. So these two things, this blue and red, I don't use parentheses if the polyatomic ion only has a one. So if I only need one of it, I don't need sub, uh, parentheses. And I don't ever wanna change the subscript in the formula for the polyatomic ions. So for example, 
you know, if I, if that said nitrate, that's NO3 from that list. I cannot change that three on the oxygen and I can't change the fact that the N is a one because it doesn't have a subscript. Um, so this example, it's showing us, here's the name, aluminum chromate. So aluminum is a metal from the periodic table. So that's gonna be my cation. And if I look at, it's in group 13. So it has a positive three charge. Chromate, um, my clue here that this is not on the periodic table is because it ends in ATE. Okay, all the polyatomic ions either end in ATE or ITE. There are a couple of them on the list that end in IDE, but majority of them are gonna be ATE or ITE. So that's your clue that you need to be looking on that chart or that list for a polyatomic ion. And chromate, the formula is CRO4, so it's got one chromium and four oxygens, and the charge is minus two, it's a negative two charge. So when I crisscross the three from the aluminum, that comes down, and is the subscript for the, for the chromate, the two from the chromate charge comes down and that's the subscript for the aluminum. So here is where I would use parentheses, okay? Because I brought this three down for the chromate, the whole chromate, the CRO4, that goes in parentheses and the three goes outside, okay? And the reason I do that is because this is my way of saying I need three of this entire group of atoms, okay? If I don't put it in parentheses, it's gonna look like I have CRO43 and that's not correct, okay? Um, some other examples, and again, you can kind of copy these in your notes if you'd want to, for, so they're good examples. Um, here's calcium nitrate. So again, I write the symbols with their charges. That's always the first step. And then I could do the crisscross. And for this one, um, I have a one and a two. So all I had to do was make sure I erased the one on the calcium. Um, I do need parentheses because I have a two that I brought down to go behind the NO3. Uh, on this next one, uh, crisscross again, and then again, the only thing is I need to make sure I don't write the one on the aluminum. I'll OH, this is hydroxide, okay? These are the, this is hydroxide ion confuses people because the OH doesn't have subscripts. So a lot of times people forget that it needs to go in parentheses, okay? It does need parentheses around the OH, so the three has to be outside. If you don't put it in parentheses, then it's going to look like it's just one oxygen and three hydrogens because by putting it in parentheses, just like in math, this three multiplies, it distributes to everything inside the parentheses. So if we don't use parentheses, then it's not gonna be uh, correct. Uh, this next one, okay, there, it's a plus two minus two. So when you crisscross, um, you have to reduce them because they're both twos. And so I can reduce and divide both of them by two. So on this one, I really just needed one barium and one sulfate. So notice because I only need one SO4, the parentheses go away, okay? I don't need parentheses on this one because I don't need more than one of that sulfate ion. Um, this next one, again, same thing. On this one, I, have, I put a one down here, a three to the sodium. The sodium is a regular metal element that does not need parentheses, okay? And then PO4 doesn't need parentheses because I brought a one down behind it. I only need one of it. Um, the last one, potassium sulfate, this is kind of similar to the first two where I bring down you know, the one and the two. Uh, again, the K is a regular metal element. It does not need parentheses. And since I only need one of the SO4, I don't need parentheses here. And that one, um, you don't reduce this, okay? Um, I don't want you guys to confuse because the two is on potassium, but SO4, there's only one of it, okay? I can't reduce that because this four is part of the sulfates formula, okay? And so if I reduce that four, it's no longer sulfate. So be careful. On that, that's another reason why I don't like the crisscross method all the time and the reducing. Um, and I like the method of, you know, looking at your charges and balancing it like he did in the video last time. Um, so then there's some practice with writing formulas. And again, you have your list to refer to here. Um, and that's it for your lesson. So when you move on to the next part, the next part is where it's gonna have the little um, kind of practice quiz to check, can you do all of them? And so notice it does have the like, stuff for you to refer to. So it has uh, a table with polyatomic ions. It's a little different from the other one that was in the lesson, but it's mostly the same, okay? Um, it does have that other one I told you about, phosphite on here, okay? Um, and then it has a table here. Here's the table that tells you uh, the, the transition metals that would need Roman numerals. So any of these ones that have two versions, they need a Roman numeral. The only ones that don't are silver, cadmium, and zinc. That's what it says right here. Um, and then it also has the list with the prefixes for the covalent. So if you need that, all of those things to refer to, okay? And 
you, you know, and a periodic table, because remember the regular metal elements, you'll have to look at what group they're in for their charges. So you'll do this, and then depending on how you do, um, it's going to send you one direction. So it's going to either send you to um, this next thing, where you're going to do a little bit more mixed naming practice, and it's going to kind of guide you through practicing some questions and answering them, okay? Um, if you don't, if you do well enough, you don't have to do that, and you'll go straight to this page where these are the links where you can click and do covalent or ionic. It'll open up a website um, where you can practice online doing uh, ionic or covalent names and formulas. And then there's a flow chart down here. So if you're really struggling and you cannot tell them apart, then use this flow chart. So, you know, do you need a, are you given a formula and you need to write a name or were you given a name and you need to write a formula? And then you would click on it and it's going to ask you questions. You know, does the element have a prefix? Does it have the word acid in it? There's no prefixes, okay, so you click it, and then it's gonna, it's eventually gonna tell you, oh, it's this type of compound, and this is how you would do the name or the formula. And you can go back to the beginning if you need to do another one. So that's a thing, that's to help you with practicing these. Um, after that, let's see, I haven't put the class video on there yet because we're just now recording it. But after that, at the very end of the module, there is a page that if you are still like really struggling after we finish today, um, I would encourage you over the break um, to watch some of these uh, tutorial videos. Okay, if you're still really like, I have no idea what the difference is between them, I'm not sure how to do them, then um, there are videos here for all the different ones that we've done so far. Um, so here's covalent. Those are the ones with just the two nonmetals with the prefixes. And then there's several videos for the ionic compounds. So this one's naming with the transition metals. And then there's one with practice problems that are transition metals. There's one with writing ionic compounds, kind of the basic introduction with the regular metals. There's writing ionic compound formulas. There's a practice problem one that you can you know, pause it and practice with it. This one has the polyatomic ions. So this is what we're talking about today that we might need parentheses and stuff on. Um, and then the last couple for uh, ionic compounds are using uh, or writing the formulas that have transition metals um, with the Roman numerals, okay? Then there's a video on like, how do I tell if it's ionic or covalent? So if you're struggling to figure out which kind it is, um, that's a good video to watch that has some examples. And then the last two, these are what we have not gotten to this yet. So when we come back from Thanksgiving, our last type of a name and formula will be acids. And so I put them on here just so that this page was complete, but just know that these last two, we have not seen this information yet. So you're not expected to know that yet. Um, if you want to get ahead though, you can watch them and then you'll have a preview of what we're doing when we come back from, from Thanksgiving break, okay? Uh, all right, so I'm going to switch over and we are going to do some practice together with all of these different ionic compounds and covalent. All right. So let me get my let me get my iPad connected so we can do this together. All right. So you guys should see what looks like a big periodic table. Let me know if it if it came up. Can it come up? Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is called the periodic table of ions. You can Google it. That's what I did. I Googled periodic table of ions, and this document comes up. So this is a really good tool because what it does is it lists the charges for all of the elements, including the ones, the transition metals that have Roman numerals. Um, and it has a table up here at the top of most of the polyatomic ions. It doesn't necessarily have all of them, but it has mo a lot of the most common ones um, like we talked about on the notes today. Um, one thing I do wanna point out, if you use this as a reference chart, um, this first one, acetate, there are two ways to write its formula, and we really use the other way, which is we do C2H3O2. So we group all the elements together, but it still has a negative one, a negative one charge. Okay. Um, so the the way that they have it on here, it's not wrong. It's just that's the way that they do it more in organic chemistry, and we don't focus on that in this class. Um, if you take IB chemistry next year, we do that more. And so we kind of see both versions of it more in that class. Uh, all right. So just wanted to add that on there for the acetate. And then notice that it does have um, this other one, uh, the HCO3, this hydrogen carbonate. Um, that's the one that 
in uh, the video earlier, it's got two names, or in the notes earlier, it's bicarbonate. Okay, so that one also has another name, right? So I just wanted to say that before we start this today. Okay, so the reason I have this on here is because what we're gonna do is I am going to write a name or a formula and we are gonna practice to see if you guys can tell me, you know, if I give you a name, you need to tell me the formula. If I give you a formula, you need to tell me the name, okay? Um, so I'm gonna start out, let's see. Um, let's do. All right, this is the first one I'm giving you guys, Na2O. So take a few seconds and think through how would I figure out how to write the name for this? And then we're gonna check in. So I'm gonna give y'all a little time to think about it and process it. All right, so the first question you should be asking yourself, is this ionic or is it covalent? Because if you can't even tell me that, you're not gonna know which way to use the, to write the names. Because if it's covalent, I need prefixes in the name. If it's ionic, I don't need prefixes and I need to worry about, you know, charges and that kind of stuff. So is this ionic or is this covalent? What do you guys think? Ionic. Okay, and how do you know it's ionic? Um, sodium is a metal and oxygen is a non-metal. Exactly, so looking at this, um, I have a metal and a non-metal, so that's the key. Um, the other thing is, after we talk about the ones with polyatomic ions today, if I have something that looks like this, okay, Na2SO4, anytime you have more than two different elements, like this one in blue, you should automatically put that in the ionic category because remember our covalents, they're all binary. Our covalent ones only have two non-metal elements. So if you have something that's got more than two elements, you should automatically know that's gonna be ionic and it's gonna be one that has a polyatomic ion, okay? Uh, but yes, the basic answer is that this is a metal and a non-metal, that means it's ionic. So that means that we will not use prefixes in the name, okay? Um, so now I just need to know what is the name of Na? What element is that? So we can go up here and look. Sodium. Okay, so Na is sodium right up here. And um, I can see, I don't need the charge to write the name, but you know, it shows me that it's a plus one. Um, so I have sodium and then O, what element's O? That should be an easy one. Oxygen. Yeah, it's oxygen. And if you notice on this periodic table, because it's a periodic table of ions, look, the name's already changed to oxide. Okay, all the negative ones on here, if you look like nitride, phosphide, sulfide, bromide, chloride, arsenide, all the ones that are negative nonmetals that are going to be negatively charged ions, the names on here are already changed to IDE. So that's also helpful, okay? Um, so this is a good resource. Usually in class, like I give you a printed version of this, but COVID, so you guys will just have to Google periodic table of ions and use it for yourself, okay? Um, all right, so O is oxygen, and since it's the negative ion of oxygen, that means it's oxide. That's it. It's that simple because that's just a binary ionic compound, and it doesn't have a transition metal. Okay. Um, what about? Let's see. We'll speed up, and we'll do a different one. Um, let's do. All right. What about this one? C-U-S-O-4. So first, again, first question, ionic or covalent? Covalent. Covalent, okay. Why is it covalent? Is it because it has more than two elements? Nope. Are we sure it's covalent? It's ionic. It's ionic. How do I know it's ionic? Copper is a metal and yeah. So there's a exactly. So there's a couple ways. Number the biggest, the most obvious is that copper is a metal. Three. Yeah, and the other thing is that it's got more than two. And I know my covalents, they're always only two, only two nonmetals. So both of those are reasons for why I should be able to tell this as ionic. Copper is a metal. And it also has more than two elements and only our ionic ones will have the possibility of having more than two. So 
now I know it's ionic. That means no prefixes in the name. So now I need to know what's this name of CU. You guys find it? Copper. Yeah, CU is copper. It's here, but uh oh, look, it's a transition metal that has more than one charge. So I need to know is this copper two, or I'm sorry, copper one or copper two. So this is one where we have to do that that um, that little bit of math to figure out. But for right now, I'm just gonna go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and write copper here and we'll come back and do um, the math in a little bit. And then what is SO4? Cause this is a polyatomic ion. That means that I need to look up here on this table kind of at the top. So can you guys find what is SO4 and what is its name? Can y'all see it? Is it big enough? Do I need to zoom or can y'all see it? Someone said sulfate. Oh, sorry. I'm not looking at the chat. Yes, it is sulfate. It's right here. Oh, nope. That's sulfite. Wrong one. Um, it's right here. Sulfate. SO4 and it's got a negative two charge. Okay. So again, be careful because like right below it, I almost circled sulfite. <laughs> so make sure you look at your names carefully. Um, all right. So SO4 is sulfate. And then because it's polyatomic, I don't ever change the name. So this is just copper sulfate. Okay, but the problem is copper, it needs a Roman numeral. And I got to know, is it one or two? So what do you guys think it's going to be? Y'all think it's going to be one or two? Two. Why, does, why do we think it's two? Because that, well, two of copper would go into that four sulfate. Uh, nope. So it has to do with the charges. So if I go back up to that table, I need to know, because remember we talked about last time, if we need to write the Roman numeral of a metal, we don't know its charge. So we need to look at the, the negative. We need to look at the anion because we do know its charge and we have to work backwards to figure out the positive charge. So if I come back up here and I look at sulfate, what is sulfate's charge? I kind of covered it up. I don't know if y'all can see Four. it. Nope. Right. The four, the, four, the four is telling me how many oxygens there are. The charge is negative two, okay? So this tells me that this is negative two and there is only one of it, okay? Because that four is part of its formula, okay? It would have to be in parentheses with another number outside for there to be uh, more than one of it, okay? So there's one sulfate and it's negative two. So negative two, and then, you know, times, times one, that's total charge of negative two, okay? So now, how many coppers are listed here? Or how many coppers are in this formula? There's just one, right? Because there's no, uh, there's no subscript right here behind copper, so that means it's a one. So that means there's one copper, and that one copper has to have a total of plus two in order to balance out the minus two of the sulfate. So that means since there's only one atom of copper, that means that whole, that atom of copper has to be plus two. And so that means therefore that we need Roman numeral two in here for copper. Now, if you, the transition metals, if you're struggling with these um, and the polyatomics, I would again, the, those tutorial videos at the end, there are separate videos for transition metals and there's one that's got the, um, polyatomics and it includes some that don't do have transition metals and some that don't so um, if you're still kind of like I you know not quite sure then I would encourage you to to you know take time and watch those because um, it will help clarify hopefully um, on the ones with how to solve for that that um, charge on the transition metal so that you know the Roman numeral uh, all right let's see what about um, All right, what about this one? Ionic or covalent? What do you think? Covalent. Covalent, and why is it covalent? Um, both, both of them are non-metals. Exactly, so there's two elements and one of them's not a metal. They're both non-metals, so that means it has to be that covalent, okay? which means that I do need prefixes in the name. So my first C is my first element, C is carbon. And then what's my, oops, 
There's an R in carbon. Uh, what's the second element? What's the S? Sulfur. Okay, that's sulfur. And then what do I always do to the name of the second element? Put a prefix. No. Oh, wait, sulfide. Yeah, it's changes to IDE. So I know I'm going to have carbon sulfide. So now I need to look at prefixes. So the first element doesn't have a, a subscript. So that means it's a one. Do I use the prefix for one on the first element? No. No. Okay, so I'm do not put... Do not put mono on the first element. It's just carbon, just the name of it. Um, now, the second element does have a subscript. It's a two, so I need to know what's the prefix for two. Di. It is di, so this would be carbon disulfide. Okay. Um, all right, let's do a few, uh, few formulas. Um, let's see. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, so we're gonna go backwards now. I'm gonna give you guys names and we're gonna write the formulas. Oops, I left a letter out of here. There we go. All right, so phosphorus pentoxide. So do we think this is ionic or covalent? How do you know it's covalent? Yep, so if you have the names, it's usually easier to tell if it's covalent because if you see prefixes, that's covalent. Okay, but also is, this is two nonmetals, phosphorus and then oxides, oxygen. Those are both nonmetals. So I need to know what are my symbols for phosphorus and oxygen. So what's phosphorus? P. 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 And then what's oxygen? O. 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 And then phosphorus, there's no prefix. That means it's a one. So I'm not going to put a subscript. Uh, for oxygen or for oxide, it has the pent. So what Code number 10. is pent or penta? Ten. Nope. Nope. Ten is deca. How many sides does the Pentagon have? Five. Should be five. Pent or penta is five. So that would be PO5. All right. Um, let's see. All right, potassium chlorate. So ionic or covalent? Ionic. It is ionic. And how do we tell it's ionic? Or how do we know that? Chlorine is a nonmetal. Uh, you're partially right. Okay. Uh, potassium is a metal. Uh, chlorine is a nonmetal, but this is not the element chlorine because look at what it ends in. It ends in ATE. So anything that ends in ATE, that means it's a polyatomic ion. So that's my other clue is that any names that end in ATE or ITE, those are automatically going to be ionic because that means that I got one of these things from this table up here. Okay. If I look, chlorate is, uh, chlorate is right here, okay? So chlorate is a one chlorine atom, it's CL, that is not C capital, that's not capital C capital I, that is a capital C and a lowercase l, okay? There is never gonna be an element that has carbon, iodine, and oxygen, okay? Um, because, and that's what happens, people think the chlorine symbol is a capital C and a capital I, that's not it. It's a capital C and a lowercase l. That's chlorine symbol. So chlorate has one chlorine and three oxygens, and it has a negative one charge. So I'm going to write that down here because we need that. So Cl and then O, three, and then it has a negative one charge. Now, potassium is a metal from the periodic table. What's potassium symbol? And then how do I know it's charge? Potassium symbol is K and it's in group one. Yes, yeah, so it's K and it's in group one and everything in group one is a plus one. If you're not sure on that, you can go back up here and you can use this periodic table. Here's potassium right here. Okay, K 
Okay, plus one. All right, so now we got to look at the charges. Do they balance or do we need to add more of one of the ions? What do you guys think? So we got a plus one and we got a minus one. Does that equal zero? Yes. Yes, so that means I just put them together. K, oops. I don't need to add any extra subscripts. K, ClO3, that's potassium chlorate. Okay, um, again, if you feel like you need more help on the polyatomics, there is one of those tutorial videos at the end. So if you're doing, if you do your um, practice today and you're like, Ooh, 